Greetings, Israel. This is titled Bantu Migration is Israelite Migration. Or a better title might be Israelites in Exile. So my goal here is to give you a clear explanation of the true meaning behind the Bantu migration, or at least that is what the Europeans call it. So uh, we're going to put together our own history concerning that event. So according to European documents and European historians, the story is that our people came from the area of West Africa in the Cameroon and Nigeria area. And for some reason, maybe due to famine or, um, you know, this, uh, climate change, the Bantus from the area of Cameroon and Nigeria went southward and sort of scattered along South and Southeast Africa. And they claim that this incident happened in two waves. The first wave happened around 1000 BC and the second wave happened around 1 AD. Okay, so they have bits and pieces of the story, but I'm going to break this down for you the way it really happened. So the first migration, which was around 1000 BC, actually was the migration of the northern ten tribes of Israel. After their, their captivity in Assyria, right, we have the two Ezra example, where they left Assyria, went west, and crossed the Euphrates River, and went into a land where no man dwelt. Now, as stated before, if they had to, if the Most High had to hold back the waters, they walked, right? Simple, right? What, the Most High wouldn't have to hold back waters for them if they had a boat. Wouldn't be necessary. Obviously, the context indicates that they walked. Okay. So they ended up, uh, the ten so-called ten lost tribes were fleeing a Syrian invasion and ended up in West Africa and scattered throughout areas of in Africa. So the first migration or better term refugees in exile happened around 1000 BC, according to the Europeans, modern Europeans. They also indicate that the Syrian invasion of Israel happened in 724 BC. That is just a difference of 276 years. Okay, that is only a 276 year difference, which can be allocated as simply an acceptable margin of error by the European scholars. But this can easily be considered the exact same time frame. So the first migration, or better stated as asylum seekers, was at the same time as that of the Bantu migration or expansion as they call it. But it really was the Israelite refugees seeking safety in Africa. So the second migration was Judah in exile when the Roman army attacked the Jewish, the Jews of Israel around 66 to 70 AD. So according to historians concerning the Bantu migration, they indicated that the second migration occurred around 1 AD. They also indicate that the Romans invade the Roman invasion of the tribes of Judah in Israel occurred around 70 AD. That is a small margin. That is only 69 year difference between the two dates. This is the same time frame with a margin of error of 69 years. So 
The Israelites were refugees fleeing into Africa from their enemies, something they had always done in the past. So European statements concerning the Bantu migration, is the European statement a lie or is it a half truth? They indicated that for some reason, the Bantus were in Cameroon in Nigeria and headed south and just took over, populated all over the place, right? So I would tend to state that that is a half truth. So I used to think that this chart was a pure lie, but after more research, I've discovered that this chart is a partial truth and incomplete story. So it's highly likely that at some point we did end up, and you'll see according to some research, we ended up in the Nigeria area, and then uh, some of them also went further south, the Hebrews. So let's now notice the Yoruba, Limba, and Igbo, typo right there, Igbo migration routes. There are two oral traditions concerning the Yoruba Jews. So the first one, according to the Benai Ephraim, a Yoruba Jewish population who claimed to come from the Israelite tribe of Ephraim was said to have been driven to Yoruba land from Morocco by Muslims and eventually mingled with Yoruba people. These black Jews in southern Nigeria are called the Imo Yokwan, or strange people by the native Africans. But these black Jews call themselves Benai Ephraim, or sons of Ephraim. And you'll find that many nations, including the European nations uh, and many Hamitic groups in Africa, we've always referred to the Hebrews who were exiled into Africa. They would refer to them as strange people or strangers in their land. There are other documents that indicate that same uh, terminology when, when, when being applied to the Hebrew immigrants or exiles, let's say. They didn't immigrate. They, they were exiles into Africa. So the second the second oral tradition or theory was by a professor, at least it's shared by Professor Dirk Lane, Professor Dr. Emeritus of Beirut University in Germany has performed extensive research concerning many West African groups and their origins in the Near East. In the abstract to one of his many essays, Dirk Lange, Origin of the Yoruba, in the Lost Tribes of Israel, Dirk confirms the traditions of a Levantine or Israelite origin of the Yoruba Nigerians. According to Oyo Yoruba tradition, so this is the second one, the ancestral Yoruba saw the Assyrian conquest of the Israelite kingdom from the 9th and the 8th century BC from the perspective of the Israelites. After the fall of Samaria in 722 BC, they were deported to eastern Syria and adopted the ruling Assyrian kings as their own. The Great Migration of Refugees from the Collapsing Assyrian Empire, 605 BC, according to Yoruba tradition. And according to Dirk Lang, in this particular scenario, the Yoruba came out of the Assyrian territory so they were part of the first migration okay and some of it's very possible like the sons of Ephraim they went claim that they, they ended up in Morocco and that's very likely as well okay and parts of the Yoruba clan actually follow this migration route here whereas sons of Ephraim followed the route through Algeria into Morocco so the Limba migration, according to oral tradition, they fled from their homeland into Yemen 
crossed into the Horn of Africa down into Southern Africa. And the Limba have a very strong uh, history, oral history and traditions that prove they are the Hebrews. Same thing applies to Igbo. They have a strong history and evidence of being the Hebrews. Now, the, the people that actually have some of the strongest evidence are the Falasha Jews, which is why the fake Jews accepted them into their land because it was well documented many years before the, the white Jews actually showed up that the Falasha Jews claimed to be of the tribe of Israel. So the Igbo, the Igbo oral history indicates that they traveled from Morocco to Nigeria, known as the sons of Gad. So just like the Benai, if he did, I'm sorry, just like the sons of Ephraim, they left Morocco and went to the Nigerian area. So this was a hotbed of Hebrews, right? The Nigerian, Benin, Togo, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Mali, Niger, a hotbed of Hebrews. And they all went to this area at some point in time, just like the Zakor indicated. As we told you in the previous video, the Zakor were in Algeria, in the area of Osirat, and they fled the Muslim invasion as well, and ended up in the same area of Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Mali, Ghana. So, according to El Dad Hadani, or El Dad the Danite, the tribes of Naphtali, Gad, and Asher joined the Danites later in East Africa via Egypt. Okay, and if the Ebo or Gad, right, this lines up. Many of these tribes' descendants are most likely in the so-called land of Abyssinia and Ethiopia. The Kikuyu of Kenya and Yibir of Somalia are also Hebrews in East Africa in the east area of Africa. The tribe of Simeon and Manasseh are identified as being in the area of Iraq. A people known as Afro-Iraqi exists there to this very day. And they are most likely of the tribe of Simeon and Manasseh. Judah is in West Africa primarily and scattered to the non-African nations as slaves, according to the scriptures. So here is a, a map of Abyssinia. And this encompassed modern day Ethiopia as well. And uh, we know, according to um, previous documents that we shared, in the maps that we shared in previous videos that there were many Jews between Abyssinia and the Congo. So that's well documented. So we have here, I'm a Zulu, the Zulu by Thomas Jenkinson. Now this is concerning the Zulus and, and the evidence that they as well are Hebrews and the fact that they have been in Africa for such a long time indicates that they as well were part of the 10 tribes that went into Africa via the exodus or the exile by the Assyrians. So here we have, they used to practice circumcision universally, but Shaka put a stop to the practice among the Amazulu. Contact with the Arabs at some period may have been the means of introducing this. He's trying to give an out. Right, he doesn't want to identify them as true Hebrews, so he come up with his fake theory there. But all the other articles and historians prove that they are the Hebrews. Okay, so the Kafirs got their name from them. The Mohammedans are Muslims called infidels, Kafirs. They have ceremonies for the coming of age, both of boys and girls. They have sacrifices on such occasions too. They are polygamous, and the bridegroom pays a dowry of cattle to the father of the bride, as in old patriarchal times in Canaan and Ireland. 
Chiefs summon their wives to the royal hut. Common men visit each house separately. If a chief's daughter be seduced, the offender must pay the whole dowry as in Levitical law, whether the father give her in marriage or not. The Jewish law does not obtain amongst them in such cases. At the feast of first fruits, the people bring in, I mean, the people bring of their fruits to the chief before they taste themselves. The Zulu, says Bishop Calloway, is a highly elaborated language, much more so than the Hebrew, which in some respects it resembles. So we have here that Bishop Calloway indicated that the Zulu language is similar in some respects to Hebrew. Okay, so this is evidence as well that we have another Hebrew Israelite tribe that came in during the Assyrian invasion. That is the first invasion. John Ogilby, author of Africa being an accurate description of the regions of Egypt, Barbary, Libya, and Belladugaria. So let's see what he had to say. Many Jews also are scattered over this region. Some natives boasting themselves of Abraham's seed inhabiting both sides the river Niger. Others are Asian strangers who fled there either from the desolation of Jerusalem by Vespasian or from Judea wasted and depopulated by the Romans, Persians, Saracens, and Christians, or else such as came out of Europe whence they were banished out of some part of Italy in the year 1342 out of Spain in the year 1462. Remember the lesson we gave you guys about the Spanish Inquisition? Out of the Low Country in 1350. Out of France in 1403. This is family. This is Isaiah 53. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is uh, Psalms 83. This is Psalms 83. The nations conspire to erase us and scatter us worldwide. So you see here the conspiracy of all these nations coming together to plot, to enslave us, to cast us out of Europe, gather us all in one place in Africa where they can come for us later and a few small years later. So you see here, even England, right? Out of England in 1422, these all different habits inhabit and are divided into several tribes having no dominion though both wealthy and numerous but despised of all nations just as the scriptures say and so abominated by the turks that they are not admitted to be mahumitans or muslims unless first baptized and then no otherwise made use of than to receive their customs and gather in their taxes so just like today they like what we do they like our customs they like our dance and they take our money but that's it the kaffirs are libertines who hold many ethical tenants live together promiscuously without ceremonies like our families are adamites following their sensuality and unbridled lust inhabiting from Mozambique to the Cape of Good Hope. The idolaters are numerous in Negro land, upper and lower Ethiopia, and towards the great ocean, except as we hinted before, some few who by the uh, in industry of the great, I'm sorry, in, of the industry of the Portuguese and Spaniards have been converted and baptized in several places. So we see here, Right. We know that many of them were in upper and lower Egypt. I mean, upper and lower Ethiopia, Egypt and other areas, Negro land, which is West Africa. All the things we shared with you in the past. So, as he indicated, we see here where Mozambique and Cape of Good Hope is. Cape of Good Hope is the most southwestern point of the African continent. And this is where many of the Bantu 
tribes lived, so-called Israelites, right? According to John Ogilvie. And we know from previous lessons that between um, uh, the Congo and uh, e Ethiopia uh, area were many Hebrews, right? So this is a book titled Origin of the Bantu by J.F. Van Oort. Now, most of the writing in this book is a theory proposed by this researcher into the Bantu language and their origins, but he gives clues that show us that the Bantu origins are Shemitic. What is Bantu? Whence did the Bantu race originate? It may seem very audacious on the part of the writer to try and give the answer to these two questions, which are of such immense importance not only to South Africa and to Africa generally, but also to the science of philology. Yet the writer's researchers, the writer's researches and studies during an unbroken period of three years have gradually convinced him of the general correctness of his answers. And for that reason, he considers it his duty to place the results of his work before the scientific public as well as before general readers. The answers to the above questions may be conveniently gathered in the following. The Bantu language belongs to that group of language generally known as Ergo Altaic. Now that's a, a, langu uh, a term no longer used, right? It's an outdated term. But back then, that's what they classified the language as. The fact that in the Bantu language, there are two distinct groups of words, one of which is far more archaic than the other, entitles us to come to the conclusion that there have been two Bantu invasions of Africa. And this once again ties into the current theory of two Bantu migrations, one around 1000 BC, and the other around 1 AD. This is the Israelite exile from the Middle East. So he goes on to say the second Bantu invasion of Africa started from the mouth of the Tigris and Euphrates and probably took place about the year 680 BC. So he ties this migration to the same time period of the Syrian exile of the Hebrews into Africa. Now he points them to an area between Iraq and Kuwait, which is the mouth of the Tigris and Euphrates. So he places the Bantu origin, or he theorizes that the Bantu origin is in the Middle East. So he's already proven that the Bantu come from the Middle East or he has uh, theorized that the Bantu come from the Middle East and not from Africa originally, even though the Middle East is Northeast Africa, but you know, semantics. It is also a fact proved by the traditions of several Bantu tribes that the region near Lake Victoria, which is in Kenya, uh, in Zanya, was the ancient and central home of the Bantu. But how did the first Bantu get there? This is a question which at present, it is very difficult to answer, but after having taken all facts into consideration, I am inclined to think that the Bantu came to Africa by sea and not over land. Well, I disagree with that, but who knows, right? Maybe some people took a boat, I doubt it. The Hotentot may have come to Africa as a Samang over land, and he was probably followed by Sakai tribes who became the ancestors of the Galas, the Somali, and other Hamitic tribes of North Africa. So remember that um, the Yabir or Bantu Hebrew Israelite group who live among the Somali Hamites. Okay, so, it's, so you have the Somali Hebrew Jews, and then you have the Hamitic tribes who persecute the Bantu. Jews up there today. But the earliest Bantu must have come much later. 
At all events, it certainly is remarkable that on the Egyptian monuments of early date, we find no picture of a Bantu, nor do we find any description of Bantu tribes. In the second volume of his Herodotus, Rawling mentions an invasion into Africa of Asiatic Ethiopians about the year 1300 BC. So, I mean, this guy said he didn't find any monuments or statues of Bantus in Egypt, but he's not an archaeologist. He hasn't indicated that he's been to Egypt, but anyway, <laughs> I wanted to point that out, right? He's, you know, I mean, there was a cover up by a lot of these um, academics as well. Okay, let's continue. Of uh, the second invasion of Bantu in South Africa, we have, however, more historical and trustworthy data. I have already shown that on account of the ancient Babylonian and Sumerian elements in some of the Bantu dialects, this invasion must have come from the mouths of the Tigris and Euphrates. At the mouths of these rivers, many of the old Sumer Sumerians had taken refuge and their number had undoubtedly been strengthened by many Semites who, for some reason or other, had considered it advisable to leave their original habitation. Nominally subject, these men of the seacoast were in reality independent of Babylonia, though there never seemed to be any trouble between them and authorities. Matters changed, however, when about the year 900 BC, Babylonia became a dependency of Assyria, and the so-called king of Babylonia was really an Assyrian vassal. The newcomers completely changed the tenor of their life and became agriculturalists and cattle raisers like the first Bantu had become. Gradually, the distinction between the two elements wore away, but not altogether. The Babylonian element was strong and died hard, and the old Shemitic linguistic factor was never altogether eliminated. It is impossible today, indeed, to draw a sharp line of demarcation between the various Bantu tribes, nor can we exactly tell which tribes came from the first invaders and which tribes traced their origin to the latter invasion. But, as a general rule, we may lay down that in those tribes in whose language we find but single traces of Shemitic, e.g. in Dwala, Mpangwe, Isubu, Luganda, and Herero, we may see the descendants of the first Bantu invaders of Africa. So he calls the Bantu Shemitic invaders of Africa. But where, like in most of the Bakwina languages, and especially in the language of the Mashana, we find a very strong Shemitic, not Arabian element. We may fairly conclude that the origin of those tribes can be traced to the latter invasion, but it should never be lost from view that the Bantu has become a very mixed nation and that at present we have but an excrudescence of the original elements and not these elements themselves. So here we have the Jews of Africa, especially in the 16th and 17th century by Sidney Mendel shown in his book is the Jews of Africa. And he talks about Jews in Tunisia, Algeria, which is where also at this Morocco, Egypt, Abyssinia, and Ethiopia. So once again, you know, we can sort of mark where we find the Hebrews at, right? And we can uh, identify that these are Bantu areas as well. Well, many Bantu are in that area. And so we know the, that the true Hebrews are black people, which we've been down that road already. But I use him as evidence to show you uh, some of the migration routes that they were actually in east, far east of Africa, far west of Africa, along the northern area of Africa. So... Another theory maintains that Jews traveling with trade caravans from Northeast Africa moved through West Africa. According to certain accounts, such as travels in North Africa by Nahum Slauchin, 
uh, Jewish identity can be found in North Africa since the founding of Carthage, specifically descendants of the tribes of Zebulon and Asher. Persecution and trade have been the major influencing factors in how the Jews migrated through Africa. During periods of Islamic persecution and for the purpose of trade, Jews moved from communities in Egypt, Ethiopia, Tunisia, and Morocco to more remote regions of North and West Africa. So they went to more remote regions of North and West Africa. What's in North Africa? Azerite. What's in West Africa? Negro land. This lines up with the Zakhor of Algeria, whom we discussed in the previous video on Osirat. They fled further southward and westward due to the invasion of Islam into northern territory of Algeria. Rudolf Windsor, author of Babylon to Timbuktu, said this in his book on page 120. The black Jews who migrated to the Sudan from the north converged with the Jews migrating from the eastern Sudan to the countries of the Niger River. There is much proof and still much more to be revealed by scholars that there existed prior to the slave trade and subsequent to it many tribes, colonies, and kingdoms in West Africa. George E. Lichtblau, author of Jewish Roots in Africa, had this to say in his book about the Hebrew dispersion into Africa. Pressed under sweeping regional conflicts, Jews settled as traders and warriors in Yemen. The Horn of Africa, Egypt, the Kingdom of Cush and Nubia, North African Punic settlements, and areas now covered by Mauritania. More migrants followed these early Jewish settlers in Northern Africa. So we see that the North African and the Israelite migration is the same. And we see that the route that the Hebrews took as they came in, it lines up with their story. It lines up with the oral story. It lines up with the European story of migrations into along the northern part of Africa, into Morocco, into Algeria, ultimately into West Africa and South Africa right where there was a huge congregation in negro land so in conclusion this is just a high level example where true israel migrated to we are truly all over africa and the world today known as bantu negroes today so you'll see the limba the yellow line right their story they go from their homeland to yemen Across the Horn of Africa into southern areas of Africa. Now, Zakor, as we stated, went to Algeria in the area called Osirat, which is North Algeria, and they ultimately ended up in Negro land and in specifically Nigeria due to the Islamic persecution. The Igbo, the Green Line, they ended up in Morocco and wound up going through to South Africa as well. And the Yoruba, this is one of the, this is the, uh, the line that represents Dirk's scenario where they ended up into Nigeria, fleeing Muslim invasion. And the Benai sons of Ephraim their line matches up with the Igbo, where it went to Morocco, down to Nigeria. And they all congregated. The majority of Israel congregated into Nigeria after their um, expulsion. So you see how they, this line congregates in this Nigerian area? So now, that's why I said that the Europeans had a half troop, because we were there. We congregated there. There was a huge assembly of Jews or Hebrew Israelites there, just like they said. And then we went south and moved further south and spread out all throughout many parts of Africa.
So if you like what we do and want to help us keep sharing the truth, please support us at patreon.com slash T-E-O-T-W. And we have a social network at T-E-O-T-W ministries.ning.com. Peace and blessing, Israel. Your captivity is ending.